The Liberal Democrats overturn a huge Conservative majority to win the North Shropshire by-election. The Conservatives acknowledge the government has been given a kicking. The Lib Dems say voters in the constituency spoke for the whole country. Boris Johnson, the party is over. Your government, run on lies and bluster, will be held accountable. It will be scrutinised, it will be challenged, and it can and will be defeated. I hear what the, the voters are saying in North Shropshire, and uh, in all humility I've got to uh, accept uh, that, that verdict. We'll have all the latest on what it means for the Conservatives and Boris Johnson's leadership. Also this lunchtime. Tighter Covid restrictions will be brought in after Boxing Day in Wales as the First Minister warns of an oncoming storm of Omicron. Four young children die in a house fire in South London. A 27-year-old woman has been arrested on suspicion of child neglect. Some Christmas cheer on the high street. There were better than expected retail sales in November as people started their festive shopping early. Inspired by Strictly, dance schools across the country say they're seeing more same-sex couples signing up. And it was Australia's day again in Adelaide as England continued to struggle in the ashes. And coming up on the BBC News Channel, Premier League clubs will meet on Monday to discuss the impact of COVID-19 on football with Newcastle boss Eddie Howe saying the game is on a knife edge. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to the BBC News at One. The Liberal Democrats have called their victory in the North Shropshire by-election a watershed moment for British politics after the party overturned a Conservative majority of 23,000, winning by nearly 6,000 votes. The Prime Minister is facing questions about his political future after losing a seat the party had held for nearly 200 years. He's called the result disappointing and says he totally understands people's frustrations. The by-election was caused by the resignation of Owen Paterson after he was found to have breached parliamentary lobbying rules. Our political correspondent Jonathan Blake reports. Two, one, three. Celebration in Shropshire and the message was clear from the winning party. This was a verdict on Boris Johnson and his government. This isn't just an upset, it's a political earthquake. For the first time in almost two centuries, the once true blue market towns and villages of North Shropshire have said it's time for change. On the march in celebration, the Liberal Democrats threw everything at this campaign and it seems it's paid off. They'll hope it's more than a protest vote and that their message that people felt left behind and taken for granted really resonated. This is a watershed moment in British politics. From True Blue, Buckinghamshire to Shropshire, we've heard time and time again that people feel like they're being taken for granted by Boris Johnson and his government. And last night, the win here in North Shropshire sent a very clear message that enough is enough. And in Oswestry, voters seem satisfied their voices have been heard. You know, I just never thought it would happen. It's, it's seismic. It's been a Tory safe seat for nearly 200 years. And, we, you know, and they've gone. I think it says a lot about Boris Johnson and I think, you know, people have just had enough. I deliberately went out and voted for Helen Morgan because I wanted to give the government a kick in the teeth, basically. Yes. Um, so, yes, I'm very pleased. So in the past I've been more Labour, but um, this time I've gone for Lib Dem, more because it was more about the people rather than m money and things like that. But um, I'm hoping this will be a good step in the right direction. Uh, previously I voted Conservative. This time, and not just because she got in, I voted Liberal. Um, just not happy with Boris or his government. So yeah, time for a change. And somebody local. 
The result of this closely fought contest came soon after 4 a.m. The Conservative candidate defeated and keen to get away. I'm, I'm, I'll repeat it again. I'm sure you'll understand if we all go and get a, a bit of shut eye and um, I go and give my, uh, my eight week old a bit of a cuddle. The Prime Minister can't hide from this another damaging blow when his authorities already taken hit after hit. Clearly the vote in, uh, in North Shropshire is a, is a very disappointing result and I, I totally understand people's frustrations. I, I hear what the, the voters are saying in North Shropshire and uh, in all humility I've got to uh, accept uh, that, that verdict. What people have been hearing is just a constant uh, litany of stuff about uh, politics and politicians and uh, stuff that isn't about them. With tactical voting at play, Labour lost ground, leaving questions about their appeal. The Liberal Democrats, the nature of them, they're, they're not a party with respect with any kind of strong ideological moorings that makes them a very potent by-election force. They can stand for one thing in one town and a different thing in the town next door. Now, that's not the case for us. We're a party of government. We seek to run the whole country and form a government. After this contest in what was such safe Tory territory, the political ground here has shifted overnight. Jonathan Blake, BBC News, North Shropshire. Well, for more analysis of what that Liberal Democrat victory means, here's Newsnight's policy editor, Lewis Goodall. This was a by-election for the history books. Let's be clear, North Shropshire is, was, as true blue as it gets. Conservative for as long as Britain has truly been a democratic country. Indeed, before, massively leave voting, older than average population, and it is now represented by a Liberal Democrat. It takes their total in Parliament to 13. That Liberal Democrat, Helen Morgan, here she is, overcame a Conservative majority, as you can see, of 23,000, a mammoth majority. And this is how she did it. Lib Dems leapfrogging uh, from third. They only got 10% of the vote in 2019 to first in 2021 with nearly 50% of the vote. And they did it, as you can see here, by direct transference to the Lib Dems from the Conservatives. You can see there the Lib Dems on top, Conservatives with about 12,000 votes. They were down, the, the Conservatives were up about 25, uh, the Lib Dems were up about 25 points or so from 2019. And there's direct transference from the Labour Party, who was second in 2019, had 22% of the vote, vote. But as I say, big transference in 2021. Labour voters deciding that the Lib Dems had the best chance of winning and they were right. We saw a similar thing in Chesham and Amersham, another Tory safe seat, different part of the country in Buckinghamshire, but massive tactical voting against the Conservatives. Long talked about, now apparently actually happening. And that translated to a swing of some 34%. Basically, if we'd shown the swing on, it would be coming off it. 34% to the Lib Dems. They only needed 26%, way past that, the seventh biggest by-election swing in our modern history, reminiscent of some of those huge anti-Tory swings we saw in the 1990s. And that's what will worry a slew of Conservative MPs in the south of England in particular, where the Lib Dems are in second place. Somewhere like Wimbledon, majority of Stephen Hammond there, 149. Somewhere like Lewis uh, in Sussex uh, for the seat of Maria Caulfield, the Health Minister, majority there, 2,457. These are much smaller majorities than we saw in uh, Cheshire and uh, Amersham or in Shropshire and this one in particular stands out Isha and Walton uh, the seat of none other than the Deputy Prime Minister himself and Justice Secretary Dominic Raab the Tories haven't seriously had to worry about the Lib Dems since they ingested them and spat them out again after the coalition a revival changes the complexion of our electoral politics so let's neither overstate nor understate this is a sensational result but it's also a by-election they can light up the electoral sky then fizzle and mean little but what it does mean when taken together with Chesham and Amersham, is the Lib Dems threaten to be back as a force and that Boris Johnson, who has for so long looked invulnerable, to whom nothing would stick, is no longer so. And that will change what he can do in terms of his power and over his party. And let's talk about that with our political correspondent, Ben Wright. What does it all mean, Ben, do you think, for the government and for Boris Johnson? Well, Jane, as Lewis said, we'll either look back at this by-election as a turning point for Boris Johnson's premiership or 
it will be remembered as another remarkable Lib Dem by-election win that in the end doesn't change very much. And at the moment, we don't know the answer. It clearly was, though, a disastrous result for the Tories and adds to a dismal December for Boris Johnson. Only a few days ago, half his parliamentary party voted against the government's own COVID measures. There have been endless headlines about sleaze and standards, parties and hypocrisy. And I think all that fed into this vote that saw a collapse of Tory support in a seat that was very pro-Brexit and has been Tory for 200 years. So what does this mean for Boris Johnson? I think you've got to remember that only two years ago he won a big majority for the Conservative Party, an 80-seat majority, winning seats that the party hadn't taken for years. I think the danger for him is if Tory MPs look at this result and now ask themselves whether or not he's becoming an electoral liability. And I think it is a big Danger. There is a lot of concern in the Tory party about how the number 10 operation is being run, the grip it has on events. You heard in the clip from the Prime Minister this morning, he accepted responsibility for this, but he also seemed to blame the media for focusing on, in his view, the wrong issues. I don't think we're on the brink of a leadership challenge, far from it. But these are precarious moments now for Boris Johnson and Tory MPs want something to change. Ben, thank you. Ben Wright. Some coronavirus restrictions are to be reintroduced in Wales after Boxing Day to try to slow the spread of the Omicron variant. From the 27th of December, nightclubs will be closed and social distancing will be enforced in shops and offices. The Nighttime Industries Association described the announcement as a step too far, saying it'll weaken already fragile trade in pubs and restaurants. Here's our Wales correspondent, Thomas Morgan. After welcoming customers back less than six months ago, nightclubs will close once again in Wales from the 27th of December. A £60 million pot has been set aside to assist them, but it's a bitter blow for an industry already struggling. People go there in order to be up close and personal. Uh, and we know that Omicron is particularly likely to lead to super spreader events where people are packed in together in that way. As well as their closure, social distancing measures, the two-metre rule, will also be back in force from the 27th here. And one-way systems and a limit on numbers in shops will be back after Christmas. Up until then, strong guidance has been issued by the Welsh Government, advising lateral flows to be taken before people meet around the festive period. Over the weekend and on Monday, the Welsh Government Cabinet will be meeting again to discuss whether or not measures need to be brought back in to put a maximum capacity on big crowds, frequenting things like sporting events in the Principality Stadium and big concerts as well. The First Minister will also be speaking to the hospitality sector, suggesting that measures could be brought back in in pubs and restaurants as well in the near future. With four restaurants across Cardiff and the surrounding area, the 44 Group has already had 3,500 cancellations over December alone. Any further restrictions on big groups such as the Rule of Six could have a big financial impact on many areas of hospitality, according to the group's co-founder. Turning a profit it wasn't really happening anyway, but if you're cutting that sort of, you know, groups of six and above, it's, it's really damaging. Currently, there are no plans for rules on a number of people that can mix inside households. But with Omicron spreading so quickly, the First Minister has yet again said further measures cannot be ruled out. Thomas Morgan, BBC News, Cardiff. Omicron is now the dominant strain of coronavirus in Scotland. And in the last hour, the First Minister has said the tsunami of cases that she predicted last week is now beginning. Our Scotland correspondent, Alexandra McKenzie, has been listening to Nicola Sturgeon. Tell us more, Alexandra. Yes, the First Minister has just been speaking and as she had predicted, um, corona, coronavirus, the Omicron variant of coronavirus is now dominant in Scotland with 51.4% of cases. Now, Nicola Sturgeon had warned of a tsunami of cases and she said we are beginning to see the effect of that tsunami. Yesterday, we had around 6,000 COVID cases. Today, there were more than 4,000 
Scotland, although we do understand that is a bit of an underestimate. And there has been an increase of 40% of cases in the last week. Now, the First Minister said she was appealing for people to go and get vaccinated. There was a record number of people vaccinated yesterday. She is also urging people, particularly on the run-up to Christmas and after Christmas, to stay at home as much as possible, to limit your socialising. And if you are socialising, keep that to a maximum of three households. Now, the First Minister had said this is the cruelest of blows. She particularly mentioned businesses and she is due to speak to the Prime Minister later on this afternoon to ask for additional help, financial help for businesses. Alexandra McKenzie, thank you. A man who stabbed to death one of the UK's richest men in what police described as a ferocious attack has been found guilty of murder. 35-year-old Thomas Schreiber killed 83-year-old Sir Richard Sutton at his home in Dorset in April. Schreiber will be sentenced on Monday. Andrew Plant has the background to the case. April this year, armed police responding to calls for help at a mansion set deep in the Dorset countryside. Inside, Sir Richard Sutton has been fatally stabbed. His partner, Anne Schreiber, knifed multiple times, her spinal cord partially severed. After the attack, her son Thomas Schreiber packed a suitcase and fled to London, his car tracked by police helicopter. As they stop and arrest him, he begins to stab himself. Police use a taser to stop him, his chest wounds described later as superficial. In court, witnesses said Thomas Schreiber harboured strong feelings of hatred and resentment towards his mother and Sir Richard and was convinced he'd been unfairly treated when it came to money. Sir Richard Sutton owned a property empire, including the Sheraton Hotel on Park Lane and the Athenium in Mayfair. Anne Schreiber survived the attack. She's now paralysed. Giving evidence from a spinal unit, she said her son Thomas had always had a furious temper and had tried to strangle her in the past. The court heard in the months before the attack he'd sent messages to friends saying he had a plan for revenge, that his mother and Sir Richard were toxic and that he wanted to go out with a bang. When he was arrested, he asked police to shoot him, saying, I pay your wages, put a bullet in my head. Sir Richard Sutton was stabbed multiple times, one blow penetrating 12 centimetres into his heart. Doctors used 27 litres of blood to save Anne Schreiber's life. She spent months in hospital. She told the court her son appeared behind her that night with wild eyes. As he was stabbing me, she said, I felt like he wasn't really there. Andrew Plant, BBC News. A 27-year-old woman has been arrested on suspicion of child neglect after four children died in a house fire in South London. 60 firefighters went to a property in Sutton yesterday evening. London Fire Brigade confirmed that the only people in the house when they arrived were two sets of twin boys, aged three and four. An investigation is underway to find out how the blaze began. Helena Wilkinson reports from the scene. The four little boys were in this terraced house alone where they were found by fire crews. Twin brothers aged just three and four. This morning they've been described by locals as lovely, polite and well-mannered. Really, really shocked because it's quite a close community and everyone does know each other around here, a lot of the people, and um, it's absolutely devastating. The scale of the emergency response was huge. 60 firefighters and eight fire engines were deployed just before seven last night. They were faced with intense flames when they got here, which ripped through the entire ground floor. The children were brought out of the property. Firefighters carried out CPR until ambulances arrived. They were taken to two separate hospitals. It is there where the little boys died. Our thoughts and deepest sympathies are with the, the family and friends of the four children and everyone who's been affected, including the local community. I, I know the area well and it will be um, hitting them very hard this, this morning. 
Emergency services are used to dealing with difficult incidents, but this in particular, involving four little boys, has been felt deeply. They did everything they possibly could, even travelling to the hospital in the ambulances so CPR could continue all the way there. Our crews who attended are now being supported by a counselling wellbeing service to ensure that they have the necessary support and will be providing support to the local community. Friends and local people have been coming here to leave flowers and teddies at the scene. Nursery teachers came earlier too and were clearly distressed. They said the two of the boys who attended the nursery had their Christmas presents waiting for them. Westbourne Primary School, where the four-year-old twins attended, said the school and its entire community are devastated at the news of the tragic loss of the four children. Our hearts, thoughts and prayers are with the family and anyone else affected by this heartbreaking event. A 27-year-old woman is in custody, having been arrested on suspicion of child neglect. At the scene, investigators are trying to find out how the fire started, as this community comes to terms with such a tragic loss of four little boys days before Christmas. Helena Wilkinson, BBC News, Sutton. The time is 20 past one, our top story this lunchtime. There's been a shock victory for the Liberal Democrats as they overturn a huge Conservative majority in the North Shropshire by-election. Still to come here, it was Australia's day again in Adelaide as England continued to struggle in the ashes. Coming up on the BBC News Channel, we will have all the reaction to the second day's play of the second Ashes test in Adelaide, where England are once again up against it after losing wickets late in the day. Dance venues across the country are reporting a surge in same-sex couples signing up for classes and competitions, inspired by this year's Strictly partnership of the chef John Waite and professional Johannes Radibi. Our correspondent Sophie Van Bruggen has more. John and Johannes's performances have captivated the audience, showing how traditional dances can be done differently. In same-sex dancing, anyone can dance any role, or all of them. So the first thing is you get four times as many chances to dance because you could be leading or following, and you could be leading with someone who is, in my case, uh, another woman or, or a man. So that's the first thing. The second thing, as you will have seen from John and Johannes, is you swap the lead, which is technically really difficult. John and Johannes have inspired people to try, as venues up and down the country have reported a surge of inquiries. They're not just representing a community, they're showing what's possible, and I think a lot of people have identified with that and said, right, now's my time to come and dance. And for dancers like Tori and Anna, it's proved to be a liberating experience. To be able to dance with women and also to lead as well. I think it's super important to be able to try both roles. I guess you have to learn like two types of steps and you also have to ask the person whether they want to lead or follow. <laughs> you can't just go up and, and assume that someone will be able to dance with you. Some people only do one or the other. So before I danced with Vishesh, I was dancing with a female partner. And so we used to compete in the mainstream. Um, and then we actually ended up in a relationship um, and I wanted to dance with Vishesh. And um, so we decided to dance together, to compete together. Um, we've been competing now for five years years since we recently became UK Equality Champions. To give it that mainstream attention and making it, you know, normal is, is what I think has been the highlight. So I have a very special message from two dancers that you might have seen before. Sadly they couldn't make it today but they had this message for you. It's John and Johannes and uh, we just want a little, we wanted to bob on and just say how grateful we are that there's been an increased interest in same-sex dance classes. I mean, for us to have represented as you know same-sex dancing has been an absolute privilege, hasn't it? It has been. And we would just like to say keep dancing and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sophie Van Bruggen reporting there. And uh, in case you didn't know, the Strictly Come Dancing final is on BBC One tomorrow evening. It's at seven. But it'll be without AJ Adudu and Kai Widrington, who are having to withdraw after AJ sustained an injury.
Now we go to the high street and there were better than expected retail sales in November as people started their festive shopping early. But what effect is Omicron having on retail in the run up to Christmas Day? Our business correspondent Emma Simpson reports from Northamptonshire. Rushton Lakes, a retail park that has no problems pulling shoppers in. And this chain is doing a roaring trade. Well, we've been double digit growth all year and that hasn't let up. So going into December, we are we are nearly 40 percent up against 2019. What about Omicron? I think because we have appointment booking, because we have um, screens within our stores, because customers feel safe, we have not seen any slowing of trade or footfall at this stage. Some shoppers are being a bit more careful, though. Melanie's a nurse. I've took a day off when I should be an annual leave day so that I can come when it's quieter because I didn't want to come at the weekends. I do feel safer outside, I must admit. Yeah, yeah we do. don't like the crowds, we don't like the big stores. We don't stores. like the big mouths. No. no, we just like this little, it's just big enough here. What about down the road in Northampton town centre? Our high streets need footfall to survive. They still haven't got back to the numbers they had before the pandemic. Now, Omicron. And even in towns like this one, they've seen a bit of a drop off in visitors. For this small business, every Christmas sale counts. It's even more important this year, you know, just to bring as much money in as we can so we can fight another day. It's definitely affected it in the last week or two. Not, not so many people around. Has trade been hit? Yeah. Already it is, already it is. But crucially, the shops are still open. For retailers, Omicron is yet another issue to deal with. The biggest thing that retailers are certainly worried about and monitoring on a, on a daily, almost hourly basis is absence rates because that is really critical when the labour market is so tight at this time of year. A lot of festive shopping is already in the bag. Christmas has been decent for retail so far. An industry now hoping for a final bumper week to see them through uncertain times ahead. Emma Simpson, BBC News, Northampton. Nearly three quarters of a million people in the UK received a coronavirus vaccine yesterday. Most people have two jabs and then a booster, but anyone with a weakened immune system is advised to have four doses. Well, health charities say some people are finding it hard to get that fourth shot and that they need more support. Our health correspondent Catherine de Costa reports. Hal Cohen from London had a kidney transplant just months before the pandemic hit. He's been shielding on and off for nearly two years. His medication severely weakens his immune system, so he's at high risk from COVID. People who are immunosuppressed are now advised to have a fourth dose three months after their third. But Hal's still not been contacted by his doctor or specialist. We've been playing the waiting game the whole of the pandemic, really. I mean, we waited for vaccines and then they were probably later available a bit later to the vulnerable people than we thought, and then they haven't necessarily worked for me. And then we are waiting for additional doses and new treatments to come along. And um, so it feels like a constant waiting and constant being at risk and, and unable to get on with the things we did a couple of years ago. Nicola Burns from Warrington has a type of blood cancer. Like many, she experienced difficulty accessing a third primary dose, which was wrongly recorded as a booster. Despite being due her fourth jab in a fortnight, immunosuppressed people aren't able to book an appointment online and her GP isn't sure how to fix the problem. But it feels like the, this small group of immunocompromised patients who need this extra dose have kind of been kind of left in limbo and, and we would, we're stuck basically. Some people are getting it, it's a complete lottery. In a statement, NHS England said, the NHS has set out clear guidance to GPs and specialists, asking them to identify patients who are severely immunosuppressed and offer them booster doses, which will be their fourth dose in line with JCVI guidance. GPs say they're working hard to scale up the booster campaign while at the same time prioritising vulnerable groups. Our expectation as GPs is that the vast majority of these patients are under specialist care and therefore uh, specialists should be ensuring that it happens. Uh, but actually I think there might be some specialists who think it's happening in general practice. 
There are hopes new drugs will offer more protection. Antiviral pills are now available for at-risk patients on the NHS. Health experts hope they'll cut the risk of hospital admissions and death among those most at risk from COVID. Catherine DaCosta, BBC News. Premier League clubs will meet on Monday to discuss the escalating crisis around the coronavirus pandemic. With nine games postponed in the last week, including five from this weekend's 10-match fixture list, clubs want the chance to discuss the way forward. The Premier League says it's continuing with matches as long as it's safe to do so. Australia are in total control of the second Ashes test after taking two late England wickets under the floodlights in Adelaide. Australia's captain, Steve Smith, earlier made 93 as Australia built up a big first innings score before Australia's bowlers dismissed both England openers before the close of play. Patrick Geary was watching. It might not look it, and they weren't dressed for it, but Adelaide was hot, roasting in desert air. And England were bowling at a survival expert. Manus Labashain dropped twice yesterday, rumbled past 100. A tribute to hard work and good luck. When he was caught two runs later, it was a no ball. So, was this a mirage? That has to be out, it is! No, really? Finally, Ollie Robinson had him. Might Australia's bubble now burst? In went Joe Root to get both Travis Head and English Hearts going. And when Ben Stokes beat Cameron Green, Got him! there was hope. But there was also Steve Smith, captaining Australia once again, tormenting English bowlers once again, as is his way. In sapping temperatures, at least England kept his mercury below 100. Anderson dismissed him for 93, but his face told the price. We'd reached the party at the back end of the innings. Australian tail-enders swatting away tired English bowlers until they reached 473, when they declared and put England in, under lights, under pressure, underperforming. Mitchell Stark picked up Rory Burns. He'd made four, England had made seven. On came Michael Nisa for his test debut. Out went Haseeb Hamid with more regrets. But Australia weren't the only thing striking. That storm will pass, but for England, the heat won't. Patrick Geary, BBC News. Mm, is the weather any better? Let's ask Stav Daneos. Hi, Stav. Hi there, Jane. Yes, it hasn't been too bad today for many. We're ending the working week off on a fine note for many northern parts of the UK. Glorious uh, sunrise here in Scarborough, North Yorkshire, much of Scotland, Northern England, sunny. In fact, I'll show you in just a moment. Further south, though, grey leaden skies continue. Example there in Cornwall. You can see the extent of the cloud across southern areas. A few holes here and there. Same too for parts of Wales. But for most of Northern England and the eastern half of Scotland, it's glorious out there. Plenty of sunshine around. That's pretty much how it's going to stay throughout the day. But it has been chilly here because of the clear skies. We've had frost during last night. So it won't be quite as warm here as it will be further south where we have more of a cloud, would you believe? So top temperatures here around 10, 11 degrees. Further north where we've had the clear skies, but where we have the sunshine around five to seven degrees, but it will feel pleasant in that sunshine. Now, fog could be a problem again across parts of eastern England, the East Midlands, down into East Anglia, really dense patches in places. Watch out for that. Most places will be cloudy tonight. Again, across parts of northern England, Scotland, under the clear skies, a touch of frost, some mist and fog here too, where we hold on to the cloud then at no lower than five to eight degrees. Into the weekend then, our area of high pressure still with us, tending to drift a bit further northwards. That will allow a northeasterly to develop. So I think by Sunday, it's looking a little bit cooler, particularly across northern and eastern areas. But for most this weekend, because we've got this blocking area of high pressure, it's largely dry again. And for many, it's going to remain rather cloudy and pretty gloomy. A bit of mist and murk around too. Some of that fog could be quite dense across eastern England, probably stubborn to clear all day. Probably the best of the sunshine again across parts of Scotland into northern England. This is low cloud, so the, the peaks of the Pennines, the high ground of Scotland, North Wales, will be poking out above it. So that's where we'll see the best sunshine. Generally, those temperatures in double figures once again, so a little above par for the time of year. Sunday, another largely cloudy day. Limited spells of sunshine, probably across northern and western areas. Signs of something a little bit cooler, pushing down across northern and eastern areas. We'll still make nine or ten in the south but uh, mid-single figures further north and east. Similar story into Monday. We've still got high pressure dominating, a lot of dry weather around, plenty of cloud, limited sunshine, probably the best of it across Scotland once again, 
and similar temperatures, low single digits in the north, just about eight to 10 degrees in the south. They have to keep watching the weather then for the run up to Christmas. There's a big question mark over which air mass takes place, but it looks like the UK is a battleground of these air masses as we move through the Christmas period. Mild air to the south, colder air to the north. So stay tuned. See you later, Jane. We will. Thanks very much, Stav Danaos. And that is it from the news at one. Time to join the BBC's news teams wherever you are. Goodbye.